On tonight's show, we have professor and scholar, Dr. Frederick V. Ingram, Jr. And now, for your host, Cool Paul. Welcome back to the show, ladies and gentlemen. This is episode 110 of the Kicking It With Cool Car Show. I am your host, Cool Car. Thank you guys for coming back. Tuning in every Tuesday night, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm right here bringing you someone who's going to drop some gems, give you some knowledge that you could take along with you, put in your tool belt, and go out and be great. This and that is why I do this show. I do it for you, can't do it without you. So if this is your first time tuning in, I invite you to subscribe. Um, you know, tell a friend, share it, all that good stuff. You know, I don't ask for much, but it does help me continue to be able to bring good people on the show for you guys and just give you this knowledge, man. I like to flood that knowledge. It's all about providing value. That is what this show is about. All right, now that I got that out of the way, <laughs> um, episode 109, I had Andrea Williams. Uh, she's an author, she's a model. Uh, she has a book out, um, Fearless, of the, Fearless of the Inevitable. Uh, it chronicles kind of like her life and her her trials and tribulations with depression, suicidal thoughts. She's had a lot of people in her life that have committed suicide. She has those thoughts herself, um, but she's doing good. She's in a good space right now, but she just has a book that tries to help people through it. She has a lot of things in there where you can kind of create a life plan to kind of push you forward and just stay positive. So you guys check that out, episode 109. Um, all of her links are in the description. If you want to check her out, buy her book, all of that, follow her on IG. It's... um. It's uh, what is her IG? Uh, Gemini. Uh, God, it's it's, it's fleeting right now. Um, Drea the Gemini. There we go. Drea the Gemini. Y'all go check her out, man. Uh, just support her. She's doing great and phenomenal things. All right. But tonight, I have a professor. I have a scholar joining me. Uh, Doctor Frederick V. Ingram Jr. Yes, joining me, and it's fitting. It's very fitting. Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday was yesterday. We celebrated that. And he is, I would like to say he's an activist, black activist. He's a disruptor. Um, he's digging, y'all. He's doing the digging that a lot of us don't do. Uh, and, and I'm talking about our people of color, uh, minorities. A lot of us don't do the digging because we're living on a surface level. You know, we're living on a surface level just to kind of lessen the blow of the reality of what we are really living through, I would say. But this this gentleman, he's digging deeper, a lot deeper. So we're going to get into that. And uh, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting. We we need this. We this is, this is very relevant right now. We really need this. So without further ado, let me bring him in with a good, warm welcome. And we'll get right to it. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you guys. Let's go. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Dr. Frederick V. Ingram Jr. to the show. Yes. Good How you doing, people. brother? What's good? I'm good. How are you? Oh, man. Wonderful. Well, blessed. Thank you. It's, it's a blessing to have you here. Like I was saying in the intro, it's very fitting. And I didn't even realize it, you know? Well, after I went and I read your profile and everything and see, just see that everything that you got going on and what you're really diving into and what your life's work is, it's very fitting. All right. And leading up into Black History Month. Like, it's very fitting. So, thank you for your service, brother. Thank you for all that you're doing. <laughs> um, I appreciate you. <laughs> yes, indeed. So, let's get into this, man. Um, you're Right now, you are a professor at University of Arlington? University of Texas at Arlington. Texas at Arlington. Yep, correct me. Thank you. Um, yeah, so <laughs> you're doing that. Now, we're talking about, like I said, I, I will call you a Black activist. Because you're doing the work. You're doing, the, you're doing the work that a lot of us are not doing. We talk about it. We're affected by it. We, we moan and groan about it. But a lot of us don't get out there and do the work. You're doing the work. 
So yes. my first question to you before we pray, because I like to start my show with a prayer. We're going to pray, but I'm going to, you know what? No, let's pray. Because I'm going to ask you this question. It's, it's going to take off. <laughs> let's do the prayer first. Let's, let's do that prayer because it's going to take off. All right. <laughs> Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we just thank you uh, in this moment for bringing us together uh, to talk intelligently about uh, Dr. Frederick's life and, and his journey and, and, and his mission, Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, and all the good things that he's doing out here in the universe. Lord Jesus, we thank you for just waking us up this morning. We thank you for love. We thank you for life. We thank you for just family. We thank you for you, Lord Jesus, and just all that you're doing. We just thank you that we're able to talk about these things and have a platform to come on here and just be expressive about the goodness of, of, of our journey and of our struggles, Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus. We just thank you. We give you all the victory, all the glory, all the love, all the praise. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen, my brother. So I want to know with the path that you've gone down, and this is going to tie into another question I have, but was there something in your life that you went through as a young man, as a, as a as a youth, as an adolescent that steered you down this path and made you say, you know what, I gotta I gotta be a a, a, a change maker, a difference maker. I gotta do something. Did did anything it's, happen? It's to funny you? that you. It's funny you asked that because I was just asked this earlier today. But yeah, I think so. I think I think life circumstances and lived experiences definitely shape how we come to the world and how we come how we come how we come to the work i think like even i remember and i actually wrote about this uh in this manuscript that i'm working on but i talked about how like even in my youth i remember being um elementary age i have a mother who was like a strong advocate for like our learning outside of the classroom my mother was huge on or is huge on has always been big on before we went outside to play, we had to read books. Okay. And when the, when, the, when, the, when the school year ended, my mother took us to the library, me, my brother, and my sister, and we all we got like like a stack of books. We had like 10 books each. Wow. And we had to read every single day. Before we can go outside and play, we had to like read it, and we had to tell her what we learned from it. My mother had us writing book reports. You know, when we were like in elementary school, my brother hated it. I loved it because it was a time because it was it was it gave me an opportunity to learn about black history in ways that like we were definitely not learning mm. in school. And so my mother was 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 allowing us to be nurtured in our blackness from early on. <clears throat> and yeah. I don't even think I real I just hadn't realized it then, but I know that it was transformative reading about Christmas addicts and Sojourner True, the George Washington Carver, and the old Ben Carson, right? Like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. reading about <laughs> reading about all of that when I was young kind of really, really set me on a path. Like I became like enamored and enthralled in like black history. Um, I think me in like fifth grade, like really being like interested in in the fact that we were enslaved and just right. like grappling with the idea of that and what it looked like. And then when I could, when reading wasn't just hit, like I wanted to watch movies. And I remember watching the film uh, about the Underground Railroad, it was like Courtney B. Vance and like Dawn Lewis and all of them that met, that were in this movie. And I remember watching that with my grandparents and just being becoming like very like intellectually curious about like that time period and like what led to that and how we got how we got here. So it kind of started when I was a kid and then just different experiences, like seeing the scooter prison pipeline, watching it happen yeah. in real time, watching people get pushed out of school. Um, we had cops as security officers, like in my high school, like actual officers in uniform with, with guns on their hips. Wow. Um, in my school, like watching that. Um, and then deaths, deaths of, deaths of people who were, who were close to me lost to the system and by the system because of the system and realizing that just how much we don't know right and right. how much of our ignorance and a lot of instances is not our own fault i mean there's definitely some parts where people just opt in and just choose like i don't want to know i don't want to learn but a lot of it is it's just simply kept from us and i think those things were all a part of it and then I've been a higher ed for 15 years before I was a professor. Okay. I worked on the opposite side. I was an essay pro. I worked in academic advising. I worked in enrollment. Mm -hmm. And I remember 
like on the on the on the heels of the 2016 election. I was working at American University in DC. And there was a few things that happened, but because of my role, I was kind of like protected from campus and even the students even. I was like kept at a distance okay. there because of my role. But I remember a situation where my admin, who was an older white woman, said, whatever you do, avoid main campus today. And I remember being like, what? Huh? <laughs> right. Don't go to main campus. And I was like, like, why? There were student protests happening on campus. It was people, the the the, the other side of the political affiliation. They were they were in droves in DC at the time and the students were protesting and there was a flag burning. It was a young black woman was holding oh, the flag oh. and a staff member, white man, attacked her. Um and Great. that became a thing. And within that same year, the diversity of the student body elected the first black woman student body president, Taylor Dumpson. And right as she was elected and sworn in the next day, we wake up the next morning and there were nooses hanging on trees. What year uh, was this? With bananas. This is 2016, 2017. Wow. Yeah, um, it, 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 it was in the news. It was it was it was huge. It was it was on CNN. It was it was everywhere. Um, and there were nooses that said like AKA because her sorority and the Harambe bait. Remember the monkey, the gorilla that they killed at the zoo, and it was like Harambe bait, and they tied yeah, it to nooses. I do remember that. And hung from trees all because she won an election, and it was in those in that moment I was I was heading to law school, um, and I changed my mind. I changed my mind and I was like, I'm supposed to be doing something else. Yeah. I'm needed elsewhere. And I literally, I was talking to my cousin, now Dr. Dr. Grimes, um, and I was like, there's something else I'm supposed to be doing. And I literally, in that moment, start start researching and start researching and, and I found my, my doc program and the rest is the rest is history, right? Yeah, I was gonna um, ask you that. Because of all of that. I was yeah. gonna ask you that, because you know, activism what I was going to ask you, what made you choose the, the path of education as opposed to just being out in the streets, taking other avenues of, of attacking what we're going through and trying to disrupt it? Right. So I think about when I think about specifically higher ed, I think about K-12 too, really, we're kept from those spaces. Mm. And we're kept from those spaces so that way whiteness can do its work, mm -hmm. right? If we don't have black educators, black women educators, black men educators, yeah. black queer people educators, we don't have an opportunity for our babies to really learn the truth and the reality of our experiences and our existence. And that is how the school to prison pipeline has been so successful. And then I think about I think about even college and I think about working at predominantly white institutions. There are not a lot of black faces in positions of leadership, whether it be you know, faculty or staff in some way, they're not really there. So who is protecting our students? Who is teaching our students? Who is there to be a disruptor? Who is there to give them a safe and brave space to be able to be their authentically black selves if we're not there? And I felt called to education. I felt like this was where I was needed is where I could do the most work, where I could be the most impactful. And that's that's why, why I'm here. Do you have the freedom to speak the truth in those classrooms? The stuff oh, that they're yes. not, the yeah. stuff that they don't teach us in the books. Are you? Do you have that freedom to really tell them like, Brother. this is this, but nah, we I ain't teaching this. This is what we're going to. You know what I mean? So it's funny that people ask that, especially being in Texas, because yeah. I'm a disruptor, and I mean <laughs> just that, right? <laughs> My syllabi literally says. Even if it was a course that was taught by somebody else, I'm changing the syllabi so it can be more reflective of who I am as a person, a scholar, as a professor. All of my syllabi have been changed to directly reflect anti-racist teachings, right? I directly address black, uh, black people in it. I directly address white supremacy and white privilege in Great. my courses. I don't, I don't shy away from the conversations. I don't allow my students to shy away from the conversations on syllabus day. I make it very clear, this class will address 
white supremacy. This class will address racism. I this love class it. will address white privilege. And if that is not what you are here for, you should probably take another class. Um, I love it. And, and that's that's how it is. And, and because I teach both criminology and African-American studies, I, I can come at it two ways. And at Fram, I can be, I can come in there like, Dr. E, yo, what up, right? I can come like that. And Krim, I'm, I'm Professor Ingram or Dr. Ingram, right. but I'm clear with my students over there as well. Like when we talk about criminology, which is the study of crime and the criminality, and we talk about victimology, the study of, of victims and victimization, we all think or we are taught or we're, we're programmed to think about crime and criminality as a black face or Latino face, right? Yeah. When we think about victimhood, we think white women and white people. Yep. And so I flip it on its head and I'm like, we ain't doing that here, right? We're gonna talk about we gonna talk about the woman in Central Park who called the cops for no good reason and how that made her in fact a criminal and right. made Christian Cooper in fact the victim. I teach from that perspective. Yes. Like you're not getting you're never gonna get um, you know, white is right and black is wrong in my class, like ever. And I don't care who don't like it. Do you get anybody that complains to the dean about you? Absolutely. 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 I just read my That's course enough. evals. I, I just read my course evals from last semester and they're like, <laughs> he talks so much about race. Yada, yada, yada. And I'm like, it's funny because if you read my faculty profile, it literally says my research interests, critical race theory, race, <laughs> racism, white supremacy. I love and it. And it says it in my syllabus and you still chose to take this class. Right. Right. I love so, it. I make no apologies. I make no apologies, brother. Ah, oh, I love it, man. I love it. <laughs> I want your opinion. Um Black diaspora. Okay. You know, it that's the root, right? What do you yes. feel? Yes. How, where do you feel we would be at? How do you feel the world would be if that never took place? Your opinion. I think that everyone recognizes the power in blackness and they realize it so much so that they do their best work to keep us separate. The part that we play in the success of white supremacy is that we don't yet realize the power that exists within us, like within community, intra community, right? Absolutely. We spend so much time focusing on othering each other, so that way, ultimately, we are at the top of the hierarchical structure. And so had white supremacy not ever touched Africa, we would be a people that would accomplish so much more. Think about what we've done through struggle and through resistance mm -hmm. and through oppression. Yeah. Imagine what we would have done or could have been able to do had none of that ever, ever occurred. And white people and those who uphold white supremacy are fully aware of that where we always fall short is that we don't stop for a minute. And that's what I do in my class. I'm like, stop for just a minute. When we think about white supremacy and what it looks like, we always focus on like the cross burnings, mm -hmm. the lynchings, the nooses, the N word, police brutality. <clears throat> but we don't talk about colorism, right? Yeah. We don't talk about the fact that that, that black men only want to date exotic looking women who look least black or how Black women sometimes only qualify a black man's worthiness based on his bank account, right? Or or how we set ourselves apart based on what someone has, right? We make jokes about poverty as if that's not a that's not a construct socially based off of white supremacy, right? right? So if we don't fully understand the role that we play in it and how we participate actively in it, we can't disrupt it. And so part of my teaching is like, yo, like, that was funny, right? Yeah, that's white supremacy. <laughs> 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 or like, or participating in certain things or like othering people and setting ourselves apart from our people instead of it being us, yeah. right? It's always like, nah, I'm over here with it. Like the respectable, the respectable, you know, black folks, right? The boomers and even some of Gen X really, you know, who, who push the idea of like, blackness has to look a certain kind of way yeah. As if they didn't lynch us in military uniforms and in dress clothes anyway, right? right? So getting people to really understand how deeply embedded in white supremacy this country, this world is, and how we are even ourselves embed 
with white supremacy when it benefits us. I think you you just answered the question I had. Uh, I was gonna talk about, you know, when you got really deep into this. Like I said, we live on the surface, right? We live we're surface living, and, and you're digging. I was gonna ask you what were some of the discoveries that you that you made that you when you started digging that you that most of us will never make because we're we turn a not a blind eye, but we just kind of we we live above it. You know, it's like we know it's there. We 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 feel it. We're living it. We know it's there. We know it exists, but we just surface live so we don't have to deal with the reality on a day-to-day basis but when you started digging like okay because you just told me some of the things but like what was like one of the biggest discoveries that made you say like wow damn you know never knew this i remember i remember being a kid and my mother gonna hate me for saying this but i always tell the truth so here we go (laughs) hey say it um (laughs) my mother had a thing my mother's my mother's my mother's a fair-skinned woman um, and my mother did, my brother used to like a really dark skinned sister, really dark skinned sister. And he loved that girl. Like he loved her. I'm talking about like loved her for like fifth grade love, but like, loved her, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> and he was always talking about her and he used to burn my mom's bridges why he loved her. And I never understood why he loved her. And then I used to like uh, a classmate of mine, shout out to Nazi, who is Samoan, right? Now they brown skinned, but she had this really long, Mm -hmm. silky hair. And my mother absolutely approved of that, but did not like the fact that my brother liked this dark skinned sister with the 4C hair. And even as children, even with my sister, my mom did not like the fact that she would date boys that were we're dark skinned. So when we talk about and I don't and I don't say that to bash my mom, but I say that to talk about we don't even understand what anti blackness is. Yes. Right? Yes. We don't really understand like what it looks like and how we participate in it by having what we call preferences. Yes. Right? And and our preferences are really rooted in being as far away from blackness as possible while still being able to cling to culture. And so in doing my own understanding of that, I would think about, I would think about, you know, the the, the, the kids that we were allowed to play with, the, the schools that we were allowed to go to, the things that we were allowed to do. A lot of those things were for protection and for me to be Dr. Ingram, but also there were parts of it that were rooted in anti-blackness. Now, yeah. I benefited from it, right? But right. it doesn't mean that it was wrong. And so fully understanding what that looks like and really unpacking that, like every people be like, like my mom to this day, she'd be like, do you have to disrupt everything? And I'd be like, yeah, mom, <laughs> I have to. It's like, I'm like, it's like being a cardiologist and you at dinner with your friends and somebody have a heart attack in front of you. Do you not do it? Cause you're not on the clock. No, right. like it's part of, it's the, it's the work that we do. So it's who you are. So when it jumps out, whether I'm talking to friends or family or just in conversation, I'm like, yo, you can't. You can't you can't say that, right? Like yeah. something you said. <laughs> you something you said about to get you for this. You said minorities. Mm-hmm. That's a dub because I mean, being 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 called a minority, right? Like emphasizes that there's a majority that we are inferior to. Correct. Yeah. Right. So we're minoritized. We're marginalized. We're historically oppressed. Right. But we don't opt into being minority. So when I heard people like call themselves minority, I'm like, no, you're not minority, bro. You're not inferior to nobody. You are marginalized. You are minoritized. Can, can, can I say else. one thing? Can I say one thing? Yes, sir. I use yes, that sir. for a lack of a better term. What I was trying yeah. to say. What I was trying to say was like black and brown people. That's what I was saying. But minority. Came, but I got you. you. You're correct though. You're correct on correct me. Yes. On but I was. I was yes. searching for that. But that's what that came out. But that's what I was going with that. Got it. Um. Got it. So. So. But a lot I, of us don't even aren't even aware of that like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And and so what I was gonna say is, as at an early age, at an adolescent, you pretty much discovered that they played a major part in making us hate us. Mm-hmm. We. It, that's it that's kind of like that's pretty much what it is. You know? Yeah. I remember in seventh grade, <laughs> I had an English teacher. I won't say her name. A white woman. She used to talk to me crazy. Like, just, I thought it was rude, right? I got and a story we used for to you. Have this, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> we used to have uh, mediation, 
You know what I mean? When they used to, like let you go if you had an issue to keep you to keep you from fighting and stuff. Yeah. And so students would take other students to mediation. I took my teacher to mediation. <laughs> like I, <laughs> I was like 12 years old, and I didn't like how this white woman was talking to me. And so I requested a mediation with her, and like she had to comply. And we sat in there, and I told her at 12 years old, and I'm like, you don't have to talk to me the way that you talk to me. You don't have to treat me the way that you treat me. Yeah. There's a better way for you to handle me. There's a better way for you to approach me. There's a better way for you to engage with me. And they probably thought I was hell. But I knew then, like, yo, y'all are not handling me any kind of way. Like, yeah. it's not. You know what I mean? All that hate so coming out. Aware. Yeah. All that hate yeah. coming out, man. Frustrated. Yes. That she had to deal yes. with you. That she even had to be in your yes. presence. It's sick, man. Yes. It's sickening. Yes. I got a story for you. I had a teacher named yes. uh, Miss McDormand. And okay. <laughs> he, he did the same thing, talking crazy, aggressive, grabbing me, all types of stuff. Mm. And one day, we were doing some type of project. And, you know, we're just talking or whatever. And everybody's talking. But she just, like, honed in on me and was like, I told you. you had that. She started stuffing. We were, we were working with cotton. She started stuffing the cotton down my shirt. Like, just ramming it down my shirt. Yeah, she got fired after that. Wasn't having that. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I almost forgot about that. You brought, man, you're conjuring up some things here. I almost forgot about that. But yeah, very nasty. <laughs> very nasty. I dealt with her for like half of a semester. And she was, and I was young. And that's, and that's the stuff that we talk about because those are the teachers who are in K 12 who then label you difficult, who yep. then label you unable to be taught. Who then label you on the, the you know I can't manage my classroom because he's so disruptive. Yes. And then they push you out. You get in school suspension, out of school suspension, and now we're looking at a situation of like this young man or young lady is now in the street because they're not in school. Yep. And then that's how we that's how we keep the school to prison pipeline going. So. Yeah. Or they give you a record. When I think about. Yeah. Yeah. Literally. So when I when I think about. Even that, like, it goes back historically. We got to talk about Brown v. Board. That's how we got here in the first place, right? Like, <laughs> this idea that we needed to be in space with these people yeah, without taking into consideration the harm that also came with that. Instances like us dealing with teachers that are not culturally responsive or not culturally aware of the needs of us, but they work in urban areas and work in the hood but do not want to learn about the people of which they are to be of service to, but they're coming in and causing harm for paycheck. Yeah. Right. And so when you think about all of that, like that, all of that, man, all of that, all of that lights a fire in my work. Brother. They're, they're infiltrating the schools. That's what they're doing. You know, yes, sir. it's almost like, yeah, exactly. Yes, You're strategically placed in there to, to do exactly what we're talking about, you know, that part. And, and how do you combat yeah. that? You, yeah. that, you, that's how we combat it. <laughs> Cause I'm gonna call it out. I'm brothers gonna... like you, man. We need more brothers like you. Seriously. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Now, as far as you know, you're disruptive, and and you've chose the the higher education, higher educational path. What are you doing outside of that? Because I know you've been on, you know, television, NBC, TMZ, all that, right? So those type yeah, of things yeah. is are those the type of things or type of platforms you're getting on to? go outside of you know your 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 yeah local. certainly like I, uh, I yeah definitely i try to be as i try to be public facing as possible um one of the things uh, michelle talked about is like yo we want you to i want to bring your work to other people that can't see you in the classroom and, and it yeah. makes me think about that often like you know we we are we are tied up in the academy so if you don't know me personally or or have had an opportunity to come to my talks you you may not have an opportunity to be able to engage so I try, I do my best to try to like be in spaces like this, um, try to be in, in community conversation when possible. Um, I've been on a few different, you know, talking podcast, video right. show situations where that allows me to be able to engage with our people, people who are, in, you know, you know, the folks that I typically engage with, the college folks and people from home, really, you know, as we're as we're addressing, you know, situations like the murder of George Floyd and Ahmaud Aubrey and a Tatiana Jefferson and that sort of thing. And, and being able to have that dialogue outside of the walls of academia, being able to have that wall, that, that conversation with our people. Um, so yeah, like any, any, any time I can, I can do that. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm with it. 
COVID protocol though. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I definitely I'm with it. So I mean, I, I've, I've definitely been in spaces. I've been invited to to, to different um, arenas to be able to have those those dialogues, and I'm always I'm always down down to do that. I, I love being able to have real conversation. So I'm not talking as Dr. Ingram. I'm talking to Fred. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Now I normally do this at the end of the show, but how can someone get in contact with you to, you know, book you or have you come and speak? Oh, certainly, certainly. Uh, visit my website, drfrederickingramjr.com. Uh, my socials: uh, Instagram, Dr. Ingram, Dr. Ingram 19. Uh, Twitter, Van Carlito 2003. Um, just Google my name, really. <laughs> you yep. get all the things. And I got all of, I got all of it in the description. I just wanted you to, you know, yeah, yes, plug yourself. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Definitely. Yes, sir. Now, you um you did a TEDx talk. You did a TEDx. I, did. I got a little clip. I want to play it real quick and then I want to come back and y'all want okay. to speak about that experience. Yeah. Cool, cool. Here we go. The African-American lived experience has been interesting, not in a lighthearted, dismissive, or jovial way, but in a way that if you are African-American, you kind of know what I'm talking about. We are one of the only ethnic groups within this country who constantly have to explain who we are. We constantly have to provide context for the things that we say. We have to explain the way that we dress the way that we talk, and that we are not being aggressive when everyone else seems to think that we are, when it's really just passion. That is the African-American lived experience. All right, you just said a mouthful in, in a minute, right? I did, because it's what they have, they've used it as a, I don't wanna say a defense mechanism, they've used it as a, a ploy, I guess, to put a stigma on us to 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 just make us out to be aggressive to make us out to be unruly to make us out to be a problem a disruption in whatever function or organization they've put in place right so it's immediate uh on you know it, it puts people on on guard on you know cops approaches they're already irritated they're already on guard they already got their hand on their hip put us in a classroom teachers are already watching us you walk into a store they're already watching us you know what i mean so yeah that a lot yeah. so expound on that so <laughs> definitely i think for me um to your point um many of us are afraid of being called aggressive we're even told if you come into contact with cops don't be aggressive don't be seen as aggressive but the reality of it is, is whether you do something, whether you comply, lay down, put your hands up and all that, they're still going to say it's aggressive. Yep. Your existence is aggressive to them. Yes. So one of the things I try to get folks to understand what and I got this from Dr. Brittany Cooper, Professor Crunk, um, as as academia in the streets know her as um, she talks about eloquent rage and, and eloquent rage is essentially saying that, like, giving ourselves permission to be okay with being angry, giving ourselves permission to be okay with being upset and not feeling like you have to stomach it because of their perception of us because whiteness is allowed to act out. Whiteness is allowed to be immature. Whiteness is allowed to be a, 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 a infantilized, even as a 45 year old man scaling the Capitol building. Yes. We, they are allowed to be infantilized and we are not allowed to be upset when they are literally playing in our face, right? And yeah. so, some of the ways that we deal with that is through joy. When when we think about, I, I gave this example to my kids and, and, and my students, excuse me, they're adults, but my students in class earlier today, I was like, think about when you were, you know, walking to school with you and your siblings or you and your friends and you walking through the hood to go to school and that one crazy Rottweiler, that Akita, that German Shepherd get <laughs> loose. <laughs> Get loose and you take it off running for your life. And in that moment, you think you're going to die. So nothing <laughs> is funny, right? You run, you don't ran up on the top of somebody's car in the neighborhood. You don't shatter their windshield. You don't care. I need to live through this situation. Right. And then when you get out of it, what's the first thing we all do? We bust out laughing. We yep. bust out laughing because even in our most 
traumatic experiences, we always turn that trauma into laughter, right? And so that's what sparked that. That's what made me want to, 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 to write that talk and to really sit with it, to one, give us permission to be angry, right? Yeah. But also for us to make sure that we know that even in joy, even in our laughter, there's still some resistance, right? Like, we don't have to be angry all the time. And even in the work that I do, I'm a clown. My friends, we clown all day, every day. I said, before I turn 40, I'm going to do stand-up somewhere, amateur night. I'm doing it. But, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I find, I find joy in those moments. And I make sure that we understand that Black joy itself is an act of actual resistance. Yeah, it is. And I, it's crazy because I have a friend who runs a concert venue in Vegas. And, you know, he, he was just telling me about how different events are looked upon differently, right? Certain events are looked upon differently. So you have a, a crowd of black people, you know, whatever, concert, rap concert, whatever it may be. And you get rowdy, you're having a good time. And it can sometimes be looked at as disruptive, disturbing the peace, you know, whatever, trying to keep us in check, right? But yet you get a rock band in there and you got white people in the mosh pit raging. Yes. Yeah. Crowd surfing going crazy and nobody saying anything. Yeah. Perfect example. Yeah. yeah. Perfect example. Or even look or even if you look at like a football game, look at any of these big ten schools and all these other schools that got these these football teams and when they win, they turning over cars in the in the city, building bonfires in the middle of Main Street, setting stuff on fire. And the cops just stand around like it's another night. We <laughs> always give, we always, and by we, I mean America, always gives passes to whiteness behaving badly, but you better not dare because that's the part of the social control that they have over us. We are never allowed to get out of line. And even any remote level of joy or fun that we are having is policed. Yeah. What's so funny? What y'all laughing at? Where y'all coming from? Yep. Right? What are you listening to? Everything has to be approved by whiteness. And if whiteness doesn't say that it's acceptable, then it's problematic, right? And yeah. so our resistance is being like, you can say whatever you want to, you can dislike whatever you want to. We we rocking with it. Like today, Tuesday night, Abbott Elementary comes on tonight. And I don't know if you've been paying attention to this, but the, the, the white teachers are upset about Abbott Elementary and the depiction of the elementary school teachers and all of that. Abbott Elementary is very similar to like 30 Rock or The Office or all these other shows with the kind of comedic humor. But the problem really is that it's not that it's inaccurate when talking about K-12. The problem is that it doesn't center white voices, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that's the problem that they have with it. It's not that it's not good. It's the fact that it doesn't speak to their narrative and it doesn't tell the stories of our experiences the way that they prefer to see them. And so they're always going to be upset by that. So no matter what we do, they're always going to have a problem with it. So you have to find a way to find joy in that, regardless of what these people think. Yeah. Yeah, man. I, I haven't seen that show, but it's... It, man, listen. <laughs> <laughs> do you consider yourself an activist? Do you, do you feel like you're an activist? I don't think that's a title you can give yourself. Okay. You know what I, I mean? I call you an activist. Like I feel like I feel like I feel like it's work that it's other people bestow that upon you. I don't feel like that's something you could rightfully give yourself. You know what I mean? Like I'm stamping like you. Don't you. Call yourself, you don't I'm call yourself. You don't call yourself famous. I'm stamping you. you know? <laughs> activist. Black guy. <laughs> Stamped on the cool car show. Activist. <laughs> Appreciate it. Appreciate it. You're next. They're gonna be calling you in. They're gonna be calling you in, bro. You're gonna be standing right there on the front line. I mean, listen, that's where you're headed. That's where you're headed. You're doing yeah. the work. And you're kind of yeah. doing it in a you're doing it in your own way, too. You know? It's not no, yeah. it's not all. I won't say you're not sophisticated enough like that, but it's not all buttoned up. Like you said, you, you're having fun with it. You know, you make jokes yeah. of, you make light of it, but you're serious about it. And you're really trying to make yeah. a difference. You're really trying to dig deep and just, like you said, you're trying to disrupt it. Yeah, absolutely. What do there's, you there's, no, there's no one size fits all. What do you think it's going to take to really, really disrupt it? How many, how many more people need to be on board? How many more, how many more of you do we need 
to disrupt it. What what has to be done? We've been fighting this fight for so long, and that's why so many people just get lost. Like, you know what? It's not even worth it. But it is worth it. But what what is it going to take? Because some people get exhausted. Some people just say, you know what, man? I'm just going to live my life, worry about me, worry about mine, live in this bubble, and get through it. But there's been change. You know, we, we've come a long ways. We've come a long way for us to just be free to, you know, walk these streets and use the same bathroom, drink from the same water, all that, all that stuff. So what more needs to be done do you in your in your opinion i think that's a really good question i don't know if it's a number but i know that it starts with people like me and, and others who whose work i absolutely admire um people tapping into that there's so many people out here who i absolutely respect and adore their work because their work is what is what helped you know kind of lead me here as well but i think it's incremental, and it, and it, and we we all want change quick. We want it post haste. Yeah. We want it now. We want it today. But again, what I say when I say to my students, I was like, we got to first understand our part in it, because the yeah. moment we understand our part in it, and we can stop playing into our parts as agents of white supremacy, yep. then we can then band together collectively to then say no more, right? But until we look at it like that, while a lot of us still have myopic perspectives of what liberation looks like, right? A lot of people, their liberation ain't really for everybody. It's for them. And it's yeah. for the people they care about and the people that they love. So until we start looking at it like our ancestors would, right? Like, how can we all, right, be, be better? How can we all move forward? How can we all live? Until we start thinking like that, we got a long way to go. And it's, yeah. and it's, and it's and it's heartbreaking and it's maddening at times as well. But I think the more conversations like this that we have, the more classes that we have that we're allowed to have these conversations, the more card games and spades nights and Uno nights and whatever nights we have in community that allows us to be able to have these kind of conversations, the more people you allow to wake up. Because I think a lot of people just really don't understand. And when we talk about stuff. I, I taught school to prison pipeline in the fall and the amount of my students who were like, I thought I knew what anti-blackness was until I came to this class. Now I don't know. Now, yeah. now I'm like, dang, like everything is anti-blackness. And once you have those conversations and you begin to make people aware of our conditioning, then we can get to, you know, rise out of that or rise above that and move differently from that. But until we get the majority of us, or I, I would hope all of us, but at least the majority of us to start moving that way, we got a ways to go because we still fighting about, you know, the black agenda. And yeah. what what exactly does that look like? And who who exactly are we putting, you know, at the center of that? Like who is whose agenda are we talking about exactly? And we don't even know what that is. Right. So we have a lot of work to do internally. And I definitely think that we push back and we resist and we make everybody aware as best that we can, but we got a lot of we got a lot of sweeping around our own front porches and, and doorsteps that we got to do. Are you more Malcolm or Martin? And do you feel like, Ooh. and, and Ooh. do you feel like both movements are effective or is one? Absolutely. Different? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Talk, speak. I tweeted, I tweeted, I, I tweeted today. It's funny you say this. I tweeted today. I said, I'm, I said, I'm, I'm nonviolent until somebody deserves to get punched in the face. <laughs> yes. You know what agreed. I'm saying? Like, yeah, I agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah, I don't go out here looking. I don't go out here looking for trouble, at all. But I'm also not with it if you come over here, right? Like this, yeah. you're not about to get a, a talking to. You get within arms, this is gonna knock you out, right? So, yeah. I, I, I say both. I think that, I think that both of them had messaging that was important. Um, I'm actually teaching Malcolm and Martin my Black political and social thought this semester. <laughs> so this is also funny. Um, wow. But yeah, no, I definitely think that both of them have points, right? They both had perspectives. They both had audiences, right? I think that I think that Malcolm, on the surface, to people seemed more radical, and people don't realize that that Dr. King was also radical in his own ways. But that's not the stuff that they share, right? Right? They share the stuff that seems like he was white pleasing right or trying to be you know a respectable negro they don't share the stuff where he was tired of these people <sighs> you know yeah, what i mean yeah you know what i mean so i i'd say i'd say probably 50 50. and it, it's tough too because when you take the malcolm approach it's it's almost like all hell breaks loose you know it, it, it's we're supposed to be the docile 
respectable Negro try to talk to the man and whether they're going to listen or not or whether they're going to appease us a little bit just to make us feel like we're making some type of progress is, is neither here or there. You know, we don't know. You, you really don't know. But yeah. and that's why I ask, like, do you feel like both are effective? Because if you take the Malcolm approach, you know, we, we fight, we fight. But their army's bigger. You know, if, if you want to take it to the streets, I mean, we could just go savage or whatever. Not saying I'm supportive of whatever. I'm just speaking, right? right? Um, yeah. But, it, you know, it's a hard fought battle if we try to take it there, go go to war. It's, it really, it's a really hard fought battle. You know, there's a whole system in place and in us, you know? Um, mm -hmm. But then if we're docile and, you know, sir trying to speak respectfully then you're not taken seriously you know it's, it's yeah. almost like until we get angry we're not taken seriously and then when right. we get angry we're taken seriously but then we we get the you know we get life <laughs> you know what i'm yeah. saying it's, yeah. it's, yeah. It, it's yeah. tough it's really tough man um so that's why i asked that question i just kind of want to yeah. see where your head was at with that but it, it's no tough. that's valid it's valid. I think it's it's we damned if we do, we damned if we don't. Like we can't yeah. we either we either we either aren't mad enough or we are or we we are too mad. But again, that's through that's through but yeah. that's that's through their lens. But we have to I think one thing we gotta stop doing is like trying to be we gotta stop trying to operate and work and live in their image. One of the things I said yeah, absolutely. about myself and I realize it's not right when I say I'm a disruptor, what that means is like I have resigned myself to the fact that I'm always going to tell the truth, right? That I don't ever care if I appeal to whiteness. I don't care if I am never, ever, ever um, seated at the helm of the greatest white man alive. I don't care. Yeah. That is not what my work is about. But if that's something that you care about, you're absolutely going to operate differently. But I resign myself to the fact that I know who I am, who I belong to, and what I'm about. And that is always more important to me than ever uh, uh, attaining any level of wealth or any level of proximity to whiteness. I admittedly reject all of that. Like, I show up authentically as, as who I am. I'm going to give you the same respect you give me, black, white, or indifferent. And if you disrespect me, um, I listen, I'm with it. I'm with it. <laughs> <laughs> right. With it. <laughs> no tolerance for disrespect, man. At all. Can't. At all. At this point, you can't. You can't allow it. You just right. yeah, Black History Month. Yes. What what comes to mind when you when you hear Black History Month? It's too damn short. Um, <laughs> we should be celebrated year round, just like every all year, all year, all year. So I yeah. I think that I think that it's a time that allows us to reflect. But I live my life black every day, <laughs> so so it, it it doesn't really shift. It doesn't really shift my life in any any way that is different than the way that it does the other 337 or 338 days um, of the year. Um, but what I think is important is that that people take the time to do um, a deeper dive. I'm not really into performative measures of allyship. Is why I even hate the term ally. I don't like allies. I like mm -hmm. co-conspirators. I learned that from Dr. Bettina Love, right? I need to know that when the going gets tough, like you like the Freedom Riders, like if they blow us up, we all getting blown up, right? right. They, they shoot, they shooting us all. Like them the kind of white folks I want to be cool with, right? I don't want to be cool with the ones that was like, nah, they was with it. And the moment the cops show up, cops, sir, officer, I don't know them. Right? <laughs> nah, I, need, we, I need you to, I need you to be really about the act of disruption all year round, all the time. I'm yeah. not interested. So, Black History Month to me is another month. It's a short month, but it's another month. Yeah. I live my life. Do it into um, the stick again. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know what I mean? Right. I, li I live my life black. Every day I do my best to teach and enlighten all days of the year. So it doesn't really change yeah. um, how I operate, how I move. Um, it's how I look at it. You know, I've, I've noticed, though, um, I think advertisers or marketing companies or whoever's doing it whoever's putting the dollars behind it we're more invested in the display and the showcase of we care for black history month and about black history back in the 90s nowadays 
it's just BET. You know, it is BET, it's black platforms. You're hearing the most about Black History Month presenting commercials. I, I just, I think it's been a drop off. That's why I feel like they don't really care. It's just a. They never, I mean, they've they never cared. Appeasement. I mean, it's like, if you, if you think about it. Yeah, if you yeah. think about like the, the summer 2020, right? When when all of the people start posting their little black squares. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, when, and when all of the big name corps started we're hiring, you know, black folks and yeah. when the streets got painted and the murals got painted and everyone was like, oh my God, this is so beautiful. It's a start. And I was looking at everybody like this. <laughs> yeah. I don't do this. I don't do that. It's a start. I was like, it's performative because the moment this passes, they're going to paint right over it. Exactly. Right. That's called, that's, 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 that's called interest convergence, right? That's what we learned from Derek Bell and critical race theory, where they taught, where they teach us about, the only way for white people to give us something is if there's some benefit to them. Yeah. So the renaming of, of buildings wasn't for us. It was so they could look good and they can say that us as insert Fortune 500 company, we stood behind the Black Lives Matter movement so they can boost their sales and they can look like... Exactly. exactly they can look like... They didn't want to lose capitalism. consumers. So, yes, absolutely. So they want right. to look like they care... Yeah. about our pain and what we were going through but it was absolutely performative because right after that ended all of that all of that went away very few of those organizations institutions corporations have kept that same energy that they had in the summer of 2020 so for right. me i'm like you gotta hold people feet to the fire like you gotta you gotta check them on that and i think it's a lot of people in those positions that let it roll because also they benefited from it, right? They yep. got something from it. The yeah. myopic perspective again, I got something from it. My household benefited from it. So I'm good. I saw, you know, what they was giving out. I don't care if you saw it or you benefited from it, but I did. So that's what matters. And right. A lot of us think like that, which is also white supremacy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. <laughs> Self-analysis. You're already, you're already doing so much. What do you feel like you could do more of? to push this thing further. You, what do you feel? Just self-analysis. One of the things I decided to do in my own self-analysis, I'm always doing that, I'm, I'm in my head a lot, rest, mm. rest. I've been intentional. Anybody who knows me knows that I do not play by my naps. I nap, I nap, <laughs> I will nap every day. I will nap in between meetings. I will nap between classes. I will nap between anything. But I'm serious <laughs> about resting because Doing this work will kill you. It will kill you, right? Like constantly being riled up and upset about the way that they treat our people will mm. literally kill you. Yeah. And one of the things that I had to be intentional about and start being intentional about is my rest. I do not play about my rest. If I say no, I mean no. If I said I'm not going, I'm not going. If I'm not doing it, I'm not doing it. I need to rest. And that was one of the things that I had to learn because I was so used to like, I was going, I was going, I was yeah. going. I wasn't taking vacation. Right. I, I remember when I left um, my my last job as a director and I left with like 400 some hours of, of PTO. Wow. Because I wasn't taking time off. My vacations were work trips. You know what I'm saying? Wow. And I was not I was not doing a good job of taking care of myself. And so one of the things that I said when I left there was that I would be intentional about rest so yeah we all need that rest man and I, and it's crazy i mean i'm not doing the work you're doing but for the record i hate social media but i it's necessary <laughs> for you know to get the message out to promote right it's just the way of the world right now but i hate it right if i wasn't doing this i wouldn't be on it but i have to rest from that just the same way because you like you just get so invested in it and and trying to push the machine forward the machine that you're working your machine forward and your message forward it, it and you you see all the other stuff you know it's hard to have blinders on social media you know you try to you try to just promote you do you whatever i try to support the people that i support people that i, that I follow whatever but then it just gets overwhelming like i just feel my energy just being sucked out of me you know yeah. and like i have to yeah. take the weekends off sometimes i take a whole week off you know, so I get it. I understand. It's not. It's not what you're doing. I get it. This is this is primitive. This is me. You know, meaningless stuff. Instagram. You know, whatever. 
but I get it. You know, it it it, it sucks the life out of you. It but I mean, we all but we all have our we all have our roles though. Like this is just as important, right? Because you're putting work out that is going to reach somebody that would have never come in contact with me. So each of us, when I right. talk about it, when people are like, you know, like if some people feel like if you're not like physically with your boots laced up and you're not in the streets marching with your fists raised, that you're not out here being an activist. No, 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 no. We all have a role in our liberation. Right. right? Like we all have a role. Like we got our street soldiers. Hold on, right? hold, on. You just, hold on. You just self-proclaimed it. You just said it. <laughs> You just said it. Yes. Own it, brother. Own it. Own it. <laughs> well, we all we all have a we all have a role. We all have a role that we're supposed to have in this, right? And and your your role may be like, yo, I got the money and I got to connect for the money, right? So that's yeah. that's your role, right? Mine is I got a station, I got a network, I got a reach. That's my role, right? right? Yours is I got a classroom, I got a platform, I got a this. That's your role. Yours is I got the soldiers. That's your role. We all have a role in this. So the one thing we got to be clear about is that everybody has a job to do. None of us is free of responsibility in what our liberation is. So, yeah, absolutely, man. Brother, I want to thank you so much for coming on here, man, shedding the light. Like, this is great. This is so great. This is so needed right now. Uh, yeah, yeah, man. So enlightening. I really appreciate it. Really I appreciate, it. It. I appreciate you. Yeah, thank you, brother. Thank you. It, it's no mutual, problem. man. No and I pray that you know <laughs> the viewers can take something from this. Um, you know, and 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 just for the record, I don't for anybody watching. I don't even think this needs to be said, but these are not racist views. This is this is the work, man. This is the work that's yeah. needed right now, just just from history. You know, there's nothing racist yeah. about this conversation. It's, these are facts. These are facts. Yeah. We speak facts on this show, and and, and you you know you laying down the facts. It is what it is, but we need you. <laughs> we need you. It. We need more. We need more uh, emails from the dean because we know you're doing your job. If you're getting more emails from the dean about a, a, a student said that you're saying this and saying that, yeah, you should be. So yeah, yeah, that's real. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, listen, man. Uh, one more time, tell everybody where they can find you. Where they can book you? Certainly. Certainly. Visit my website, drfrederickingramjr.com. Hit up my Instagram, dr.ingram19, or my Twitter, Van Carlito, V A N C A R L I T O 2003. Yes, all of it is in the description. Click away, support this brother. He's doing God's work, he's doing his life's work. And that's a blessing. Anytime you can do that, that's a blessing. Hey, guys, you know where I'm at. Every Tuesday night, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I'm right here kicking it with somebody bringing you value. Uh, I appreciate you guys. Like we said, uh, follow us, man. I'm Cool Card on Instagram. Follow him. He's Ingram 19 on Instagram. Follow him. Go to his website. All of that. We just appreciate the support. Share this with somebody if they need to hear it. If you loved hearing it, there's somebody else that would love hearing it. Share it. Show that support. We support you by being here. Dropping these gems, man. All right. Till next time. Peace and love. Appreciate you, my brother. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We out of here. Till next time, y'all. Later.